Thank you for coming to the Aquatics Lounge. My name is Matt DiMaggio. I am an assistant professor at the University of Florida's Tropical Aquaculture Laboratory. And what I wanted to talk to you about today was developing new species for the ornamental fish industry, and specifically the ornamental fish industry in Florida. So U.S. aquaculture, uh, broadly speaking, is about a $1.3 billion industry. And of that, you see food fish makes up most of that uh, value. With ornamental fish, they're at, at just 3% of that overall market. The Florida aquaculture industry is incredibly diverse, uh, made up of not only ornamental fish, but things like mollusks. We have a, a very big uh, clam industry in the state. Uh, reptiles such as alligators, shrimp, crayfish, aquatic plants, food fish. So there's really a, a broad diversity of, of animals that we grow here in the state that you really don't see anywhere else in the country. Um, there's about 400 operations with appreciable sales. So the ornamental industry here in Florida is worth about 27 million, and that was farm gate back in 2012. So just selling fish right off the farm. There's about 140 ornamental producers in the state, um, and 95% of that is freshwater fish that are produced here. Um, interestingly, all the, the freshwater species that uh, that you usually will see in a pet store are uh, primarily cultured, and there's hundreds and hundreds of different species and varieties. On the opposite end of the spectrum with, with the marine species that you'll, you'll normally see for sale, um, there's usually only about 75 to 100 different species that are actually grown uh, captively, and that changes depending on market demand. Uh, but the marine side of things is, is somewhat of a growing market. So why do we want to look at developing new species? Uh, and, and the main thing is, is that, that that innovation, that being able to market a, a species for the first time or being the only person who's able to grow and sell that fish um, gives the producer a great competitive advantage. And that's what we're trying to do here, especially for the Florida producers, is give them that competitive edge, make them more profitable by giving them a product nobody else is able to produce or is able to sell yet. And so the, the three questions we sort of have to ask when we're trying to develop a new species is, first, can we sell it? You know, it, it's not if you grow it, the people will come, they will buy it. You need to be able to sell your product at the end of the day. Um, then can we spawn it? Can we get the fish to reproduce in captivity now that we know that we have something that we can sell? And then can we take that baby fish and raise it all the way to market size so that we can sell it uh, later on? And the, the old adage goes, you don't make money growing fish, you make money selling fish. And there's a lot of people who, who kind of miss that and, and have the mentality of if you grow it, they will come. So we, we try and start with, with the economic side of things. So those, those economic considerations uh, that we want to think about are, A, what's the, the market demand for the fish? Are there already existing markets for the species? Is it something that's already collected from the wild and we can just domesticate it? and then sell it? Um, what's the, the situation with the wild supply? Um, are there regulations that are coming down that are gonna limit the wild supply of fish? Is it something that's gonna be in short supply later on? Can we use that for marketing the species? You know, do we wanna look at something that's low price and super high volume for economies of scale? Or do we wanna go with something that is super expensive and pricey, uh, but it has a very low volume? So all these things we need to consider. And then we need to look at the actual production cost. What's it going to cost us to raise this fish to market size? What do we need for infrastructure to grow it? Uh, what kind of labor, electricity, feed, all these things that are associated in the production cost for the fish? And then finally, is it going to be profitable? Because at the end of the day, somebody has to make money doing this. So from the technical side of things, those are the, the economic considerations. From the technical consideration standpoint, uh, there's a lot of things that we need to figure out before we're able to raise these uh, new species. So the first thing is what kind of culture systems are you going to be able to hold this fish in? Can you hold the brood stock and the larvae and the grout in similar systems? Are you going to need different sized tanks, things like that? How do we get them to reproduce? How do we grow the larvae? And finally, how do we get them to, to market size? So for production systems, one of the, the initial questions is, well, can you grow these inside or can you grow them outside? Can you grow them intensively or extensively? Uh, the broodstock, can you keep them in ponds? Can you keep them inside in recirculating systems? What are the trade-offs of both of those things? 
can you get the fish to reproduce year-round, what's called off-cycle spawning? Some fish may only spawn in the springtime or due to weather patterns, things like that. Can you actually manipulate that environment and make sure that the fish is constantly reproducing year-round so that you're able to supply the market? Uh, and where are you located? Geographic location is one of the things that gives Florida producers a great advantage over other areas in the United States. Our climate allows us to grow a wide variety of tropical fish outside uh, in, in somewhat low-cost production systems. Uh, finally, also, what are your production goals? Uh, how many you need to produce per year? And one of the big ones, too, is, is what's your access to water? If you're growing freshwater fish, you know, is the hardness, is the pH, is all of the water parameters that you need to grow and spawn the fish, are those correct uh, for the species that you're looking at? <clears throat> or if you're growing a saltwater fish, do you have access to salt water? Is it something that you can bring in right from the ocean or is it something that you're going to have to make with synthetic sea salts? In terms of reproduction, uh, we want to look at what's the life history of the fish? Where does this fish normally occur? Uh, when does it reach sexual maturity? Is it something like a sturgeon where it's going to take you six to eight years before you have a sexually mature fish? Do you have to invest that much time? Or is it something really fast like, you know, like a wrasse where you can have it sexually mature in nine months? These are all critical questions when you're trying to evaluate what species you want to produce. Um, the more we, we know too about what actually happens in the wild. Do these fish aggregate when they spawn? Can we recreate that in the laboratory in a production environment? Do they spawn pelagic floating eggs or do they spawn demersal sticky eggs that are large with well-developed larvae. And how many of those eggs do you get? What's the fecundity on that? All these are, are critical components that are going to allow you to formulate a business plan around trying to, to figure out you know, how you produce the fish economically, um, how many eggs you'll get if it's a multi-batch spawner, the availability of the broodstock I spoke about before, and then finally, too, what do you, what do you feed the fish? You are what you eat, so what do you feed these fish so that they are going to produce high quality eggs that give you high quality larvae? We need to know all of these factors about reproduction before we can actually consider looking at a new species. So like I mentioned before, environment's a big one, looking for things like spawning cues, uh, also the biology of the fish, so for example, gender. We work with a lot of species, especially on the marine side of things, that uh, those species will actually change sex. They're sequential hermaphrodites. So in that picture you see right there, clownfish are a prime example where the largest fish will be the female and the male will be the smaller fish and they'll transition if the, if the female is actually lost at some point in the process. Or things like seahorses where actually the male will actually incubate uh, the eggs, the, the larvae right there in the pouch. So all of these things are, are critical to tease out and know um, and it can be difficult when you're working with a new species or a species that there's not that much information out there for. Um, what's their mating system? Are they monogamous? Are they promiscuous? So wrasses, for example, will form big harems. Can you manipulate that and can you use that to your advantage for producing these fish in captivity? And they do that, uh, for example, with clownfish, keeping them in pairs. Um, and then also, is there any parental care? Again, uh, seahorses, clownfish are great examples of parental care. So spawning, how do you get them to spawn? <clears throat> well, first there's what's called volitional spawning, which is actually where the males and the females will release their own gametes into the water volitionally without any sort of manipulation. Um, one thing you can do to actually sort of promote that is photothermal manipulation. So manipulating the photo period, manipulating the temperature of the water. These are main drivers that cause fish to reproduce in the wild. These, these sort of cues, whether they're environmental um, will actually be interpreted by the fish's brain and it says, oh, it's getting warmer. Oh, it's getting, uh, you know, the, the day length is getting longer, it's getting shorter. And that, that message is actually converted in the brain into chemical signals that tells the fish it's time to spawn. And the more we know about that process, the more it gives us an opportunity to manipulate that process in an aquaculture setting and make the fish do what we want to do, make it spawn when we want to spawn. Uh, we want to be able to turn these fish on and off when we want and make them uh, reproduce you know, on our command. So things like pH, conductivity are important uh, for a lot of freshwater species. The presence or absence of substrate uh, is another important thing to consider. And then if that doesn't work, we can always look at using uh, hormones to actually induce the fish to spawn. There's commercially available spawning aids that we can use to sort of override those environmental cues and make the fish reproduce for us. 
So one of the other things to consider now that, that we've hopefully sort of figured out how to spawn the fish is once we get the fish to spawn and we hatch the eggs out, what kind of larvae are we going to be dealing with? What kind of larvae are we going to be working with you know, when we're trying to raise these fish? And there's, there's sort of two kinds of larvae to consider. One is called altricial larvae, and this is characteristic of a lot of marine fish, that picture that you see there at the very top. And what they are is really they're poorly developed, uh, essentially it's a, a notochord like a vertebral column with, a, with a, a ball of yolk there and a little globule of oil. And they don't usually have functional eyes, they don't have a functional mouth when they hatch, and they really have uh, no GI tract to, uh, to sort of a rudimentary tube when they hatch out. Um, and these larvae will usually require some sort of live feed as a, as a first feed for the, the first time that, that they're going to eat. They usually require some type of live feed. And, and they're also just very, very fragile. They're a fragile larvae to work with. Whereas on the opposite end of the spectrum, you have something called a precocial larvae. And what you see there is, a, is an example of a salmonid larvae, which are, I mean, enormous with a, a huge yolk reserve. And these larvae are usually well-developed. They'll hatch out with a working mouth already. They'll have a huge yolk reserve able to support them for a while. Um, and they're, they're much better able to thrive in a captive setting versus those altricial larvae. And knowing if that new species will, is going to give you an altricial versus a precocial larvae is incredibly important because it's going to help you figure out you know, what you need to feed it, things like that. So one of the other issues we have to deal with now that we know, okay, we're going to be working with these different kinds of larvae are what sort of bottlenecks are we going to run into when we're trying to raise this fish? Uh, one of the main things that we run into in terms of bottlenecks where we see a lot of mortality is at first feeding. We have those larvae that, that, that just finish absorbing their yolk, their mouths open, and now you need to put something in the mouth of that larvae pretty quickly. They have a really high metabolic demand. They want to grow fast. They want to uh, make all of these new organs and systems and become more complex in their body, and they need nutrition to do that. Nutri nutrition is critical. So for first feeding, we need to give these, these larvae something that A, they're going to be able to capture. So they have to be able to, to look around and say, oh, that's a food particle, I want to eat that. And they need to recognize that. And, and right there you see on the top is a picture of a, a marine fish with a copepod. Um, then also, not only do they have to recognize that it's food, but then they also have to be able to actually fit that in their mouths. So there's this gape limitation factor. They physically have to be able to put that food organism in their mouth. And that can be an issue depending on some of these fish and whether it's an altricial or a precocial larvae. And then finally, if they can recognize it as food, get it in their mouth, now they need to be able to make use of that nutrition and actually digest that food and turn it into muscle or growth or something like that. So first feeding is a huge bottleneck that we have to deal with. Then you also run into things, especially on the marine side of things, swim bladder inflation. When the fish takes that gulp of air, pulls in a big bubble of air, and that's what they use to inflate their swim bladder so they can float around in the water. Uh, flexion is another area. That's when they start their fin formation. They start developing all of these elements that turn into their caudal fin. And then finally, metamorphosis, which is when they turn from a larvae into something that you would recognize as a uh, sort of juvenile fish. And we need to know uh, the nutritional requirements as well. Things like fatty acids uh, are crucial, especially for marine fish, and making sure that the fish have the properly balanced uh, diet that they need to develop and progress um, so we can raise them again and bring fish to market. So timing is, is critically important. Like I was just telling you, timing is everything in raising larval fish. You need to know when to introduce all these different kinds of feeds, different sizes of feeds, to make sure we get maximum growth and minimize that mortality. We want to transition the fish as soon as possible off those sort of live diets onto a powder diet or a flake diet or something that I can go into the fridge, pull out, and put in a tank, something that is less labor intensive. Because we want to reproduce these fish as cheaply as possible to maximize our profits. So we want to transition them as quickly as we can to commercially prepared diets. So we want to look at what's called weaning, getting them from that live to that inert. And during that period is another, another point in time when the fish like to die. If it's one thing larval fish like to do, it's they like to die, especially at, at these critical bottlenecks is where we lose a lot of the fish. And transitioning from those live diets to those inert diets is another area uh, just like first feeding and swim bladder inflation, where we can see some of those mortalities. And again, it's another step where we want to figure out, so what's the best time to do this and what are we expecting in terms of survival? 
And can we do this in a recirculating system? Or can we do this in a pond outside? Can we bloom up a pond full of zooplankton and, and stock the larvae into the pond where they can graze down the zooplankton and then we can start throwing in a commercial diet? These are all critical, critical pieces uh, to try and figure out when we're raising fish. So here's an example of some of the developmental progression of a millet seed butterfly fish, one of the species uh, that we worked with down at the lab at, at the University of Florida. And it was actually finished off, they finished raising this uh, fish species out at the Oceanic Institute in Hawaii. Uh, we did some of the preliminary work here, and like you can see on the photo series, uh, day 13, you can clearly see right in the center of the body, there's the swim bladder, that, that sort of vacant space in the center there. The fish gets a little bigger, a little bigger as it progresses. By around day 26 or so, you go through what's called flexion, where that, that sort of notochord there starts to flex up, and you can actually see the, the caudal fin, the tail fin, forming more. It gets, it gets more pronounced. And then they keep going and going, and, and, and actually this species has what's called a thalicthes phase, where the butterfly fish will actually get these big bony plates on their head, which again is another point where they like to die. So this is specific actually uh, uh, to, uh, to butterfly fish in this case, and it's another critical component that we have to know about when we're trying to raise a, a new species like a butterfly fish. So when I was telling you about uh, how to feed the fish and, and trying to figure out transition, here's just a quick example of something that we're, we're interested in, in knowing, and, and that's at what size of the fish, uh, you know, at what size do you start to offer these, these new diets? So here you see a, a sort of a, a growth curve, and from, so from day zero to about day 20 of their life, that would be when we would feed them something like rotifers right there. And then after day 20 to day 35, this would be something where we would feed them something like artemia. And then after we feed them that artemia or the brine shrimp, that would be when we would transition them to that commercial diet. And just this information alone, this tells us at what size we need to feed the fish certain kinds of diets, uh, when those developmental milestones are in there, that swim bladder inflation when they go through metamorphosis. And what we want to try and do when we're developing protocols for new species is come up with, with sort of this, this graphic here or this sort of cookbook recipe where we can say, this is what you need to do at each step along the way to make sure that you're going to be able to raise these species. So grow out is, a, is another uh, concern. So now that we've made it through all the bottlenecks of spawning the fish and, and raising the larvae, now what we need to know essentially how do we get this fish from a juvenile size to a market size as quickly as possible so you guys can get that to market and, and turn a profit on it. And so things like, can we grow them in recirculating systems, which is characteristic for marine fish? Can we grow them in ponds, uh, which is a common production unit for freshwater ornamental species in Florida? What salinities can we grow them in? How many fish do we put in a pond? How many fish do we put in a, in a research system? How much do we feed them, and how efficiently can they use that, that feed, what's called the, the feed conversion ratio? So one pound of feed will hopefully make one pound of fish, but that's usually not the case. So how efficiently can they take that one pound of feed and turn it into fish? That's another great thing to know. And finally, how long is it gonna take us to get to market size? And can we maybe manipulate that too? Can we manipulate that to maybe grow some fish faster and grow some fish slower so that we can have the same size fish year round available to the market? So can, how, how do we manipulate that and make it more pro profitable for the growers? So to, to give you a, a, a couple examples now, now that I, I've touched on a, a bunch of the, the bottlenecks sort of and the, the considerations when we're growing new species, I just want to talk real fast about a couple of the marine species that we worked with uh, down at the aquaculture lab. Um, we're focusing on marines. It's, it's been gaining uh, more and more attention as of late. And that's predominantly due to uh, the supply, like I said before, is currently coming from the wild. There's a lot of wild harvest on the marine side of things. And uh, we're looking at about 1,800 or so different species that are being collected each year for the marine aquarium trade. That's over 24 million fish. Uh, so the market is there if we're able to domesticate some of these species and produce them in captivity. And then there's also the sustainability issue of this as well. Um, we really don't know what the effect of collecting fish from the wild are. And I'm sure it's, it's sustainable in some cases and it may not be sustainable in, in other cases. It's really data poor and it's information that we need. Um, but it's nice to start to develop some of these techniques uh, before we find out that, that some practices may not be sustainable. So that's why we're trying to invest in that research now. 
Um, the market right now, you're looking at about 700,000 U.S. households, over 2 million home and public aquaria. And again, this is to try and diversify aquaculture and diversify the number of products that we're able to offer. So what's the big holdup? Uh, why aren't we producing more and more marine species if there's all this interest? First, uh, while there's interest from consumers and from uh, some of the wholesalers, things like that, there's limited research for figuring out how to grow marine fish. It doesn't fit nicely into you know, some of the, the funding agencies' boxes for food fish and things like that. And then again, we have all those technical bottlenecks I was just telling you about. So if we're looking at 1,800 different species being brought into the U.S. each year, uh, that's 1,800 different species and 1,800 different sets of bottlenecks to figure out. And usually each species has some little trick or, or tidbit that no one knows yet until you start working with it. So the diversity is pretty, pretty daunting in terms of figuring out the spawning and the larval rearing and all that. So today we've successfully cultured about 300 or so different marine species. And when I say cultured, I mean we've taken them from egg to the larval size once, at least once. And there's probably about 75 to 100 that are in production that we can do over and over again and people can sell those commercially. The question is, what can we do that's profitable? Because no one's gonna grow fish and the conservation benefits aren't gonna be realized if no one can make money at this. At the end of the day, it's a business. Aquaculture uh, needs to turn a profit. So we really need to figure out the most cost-effective way to produce some of these fish. <clears throat> so this is the part of the talk where I, I tell you why growing marine fish is so difficult and why I'm jealous of people who grow pigs and chickens. So a pig farmer starts with an adult pig and, and they, they reproduce the pig and you end up with nice little piglets right there when they're born, they're happy, they eat, they look like nice little piglets. You can tell it's, it's a pig. Chickens, okay, they, they lay eggs. And the eggs hatch out and, and you have little poults or you have little chickens and they look like a little chicken with something like a blue tang or another fish that spawns a pelagic egg, they spawn and they release their eggs and the eggs hatch out and you end up with that. A two millimeter long, essentially vertebral column with a little bit of yolk and you can't tell whether that's a tang, a butterfly fish, a grunt. Um, and again, they're super, super fragile. Um, so that's one of, the, one of the main things to start out with is, is just the fragility of the larvae that we're dealing with on the marine side of things. So the reproduction and the larval culture are two big things that we've got to deal with. And then like I mentioned before, well, what do we feed these guys? And, and a lot of these marine fish feed on live feed, so things that are alive. Advantages, <clears throat> excuse me, to, to using live feeds are that they're easily digestible. So you can digest a rotifer, like you see there on the top of the screen, or a copepod, like you see there on the bottom of the screen. And when I say copepod, that's the, that's the zooplankton that's out in the ocean floating around. Um, is one of the things we use to try and feed these marine fish. Um, they're easily digestible compared to something like a pellet or a flake. Uh, they're available to the fish. They're constantly swimming around in the water versus putting pellets in and they sink to the bottom and the fish can't eat them. And they cause the fish to want to eat them and they're, and they're good for them nutritionally. But the disadvantage is, is now instead of going to the fridge and pulling out a bag of flake food, I have to reproduce another live organism. So there's cost associated with that. There's labor associated with that. And it's also the reliability factor. So now I need to know that I have somebody who can reliably give me copepods or rotifers every single day so that I can produce my fish larvae. And then finally, there's also the potential to introduce diseases and pathogens too, because now I'm growing another live organism that could introduce bad things into my tank, bacteria, you know, parasites, things like that. So, so there's pros and cons to using those live feeds. And the three major live feeds that we work with on the marine side of things are rotifers that you see there at the top, artemia or brine shrimp in the center there, sea monkeys, and copepods, which are the, on the bottom there. That's a baby copepod called anoplii. Um, which are the zooplankton floating around in the ocean. Rotifers are, are easy to grow. There's defined protocols. We can grow them at super high density and I can feed those guys an algae paste that I take out of a freezer. So super easy to raise um, and, and not a lot of labor involved comparatively. Artemia is also another great one. I can go to the store, I can buy a can of Artemia cysts and just dump them in water and hatch them, which is spectacular from a labor standpoint is I just hatch however many I need. The problem with Artemia is, is starting to be the supply. They're mostly harvested from the wild from the Great Salt Lake in Utah, 
And the level of the Great Salt Lake is going down and down and down and down. People are drinking it. It's being used for irrigation. Um, so we're not sure what the effect is going to be, how much longer our team are going to be readily available for. So it's time to start looking at alternatives and, and the cost. As the availability goes down, the cost for our team goes up. Um, and another issue we have to deal with as well is, is size. I, as I said before, the larvae has to physically be able to eat that live feed. So rotifers may be about 150 microns or so, so 0.15 millimeters. Whereas artemia may be about 350 to 400 microns. So that's a, a much larger organism. Whereas copepods, which are actually great because they're super, super tiny, about 0.05 millimeters, 50 microns, so the marine fish larvae can eat those really easily. Um, but the problem with those guys is, is they only want to eat live algae. So now I have to grow another thing to grow the live feed before I can feed it to the larval fish that I want to grow. I'm recreating levels of the food chain that are in the wild. Um, and again, that increases the cost to produce these animals. So the other thing too is that we're dealing with on the marine side of things is, is the easy ones have been done. If you walk around here and you look at some of the, the, uh, the fish that are being grown in the aquatic lounge here, um, a lot of the cultured fish are some that are on this list. Things like clownfish, dottybacks, gobies, seahorses. We've gotten really good at growing some of these species and doing it reliably. And, and the, the commonality, the thing that all those species have in common is that they all spawn a demersal egg, so a big sticky egg that usually ends up on the bottom or in a PVC pipe or on a tile. The eggs are large. The larvae that hatch out are large. They're those precocial larvae. There's usually some form of parental care, so that the, they have a better shot at surviving, and all of those fish will eat those rotifers. So that's why we can raise a lot of the ones that we've been able to raise, and why we can't with some of the other species. So we're trying to explore some of these different avenues when we're, we're developing new species and looking at some of the ones that haven't been done. So that begs the question then, what's left? What's left to be raised? Well, actually, there's a lot left to be raised. There's a lot of pelagic spawning fish that are out there. Things like tangs, like dory, uh, butterfly fish, like you see there in the middle, the millet sea butterfly fish. Rasses are another super popular one that have been uh, uh, imported and uh, sold in the industry. And currently there's no aquaculture protocols really for a lot of these species, or we've just now started to make some headway. And the thing that all these guys have in common is they all spawn that small pelagic egg that gives you those small altricial larvae that all they want to do is die at all those different bottlenecks and all they want to eat is copepods. Um, so the, the, the interesting thing and the fun thing for us is we're working with species that, that no one's been successful with before and we're trying to figure out all these, these cookbook recipes uh, for how to produce these species. So just to cover two species real quick that we're working with in closing, uh, first is the, the Pacific Blue Tang. So the, the 12th most uh, imported species uh, into the United States. I mean, retails roughly for about 65 bucks for a four inch fish. And if you equate this on a per pound basis, like you go to the store and you buy tilapia on a per pound basis, $8 a pound or whatever it is retail at your supermarket, a Blue Tang would be worth about $590 a pound. So you can see how attractive it is for people who want to produce these fish because they can make a lot of money in a very small space. Because uh, you can grow a four inch fish, you know, a lot of four inch fish in a tank versus tilapia. The thing is, it's a lot more difficult to grow a blue tang than it is a tilapia. So there are those trade-offs. But that's what we're trying to figure out is how to do it and how to do it cost effectively. Uh, the markets, the blue tangs are heavily traded. Obviously the movies Finding Nemo, Finding Dory, we're huge for uh, uh, you know, bringing this species uh, into more visibility for the public, uh, the conservation angle that I talked about, but there was nothing known production-wise for this species in terms of spawning it and producing the larvae. So what we did <clears throat> is procure some broodstock and work with the broodstock and try and figure out, okay, well, how do we get them to spawn? And, and these guys, if you keep them well fed and keep them in the right conditions, will spawn volitionally, like I told you before. If you look at that video at the bottom there, that's a pair of, of adult blue tangs that are getting ready to spawn. They'll swim around and then there. That little puff of, of smoke there is, is the male and the female releasing milk and eggs together. Um, and they'll do that repeatedly and, and that you could get eggs three, four, five times a week from fish and, and that's great to know if you're trying to produce these fish. Uh, their eggs are about 800 microns, uh, about 0.8 millimeters. 
So pretty small leg, but not super tiny for a marine fish. And this was one of the, the, the critical things that we were, were finding when working with this fish was how to get eggs reliably. And we still uh, work on that is how do we get them to produce eggs when we want, as many as we want. So one of the other critical things that I've talked to you about too is, is what do you feed them? So you have an 800 micron egg, a fish, a larval fish hatches out, it's 1.6, 1.8 millimeters in size. What do you feed it? Well, that brings us back to the diet. So what's on the menu? Copepods for a good amount of time, over 36 days. And what you see there is essentially is, is the diet for the fish from day three all the way up past day 36. But trying to figure out what to feed them, how many, how many copepods do I put in the tank, how many rotifers, how many artemia, when does that happen? This is all part of teasing out that, that recipe, that cookbook recipe for how to grow new species. And what you see there is what we found to be most effective so far for, for growing the blue tang, transitioning from copepods to rotifers and then to artemia. So here is a depiction of, of sort of the, the developmental steps that you, you go through where you have, you know, the larvae that first hatches out right there. That's a five-day post-hatch larvae at the top. Then to 15 days, you see it's got some of the, the spines forming. Its eyes are pigmented. 19 days and 27 days there, those, those spines start to really elongate. But still, if you looked at this, you wouldn't know that this was a blue tang. The changes that some of the marine fish go through during their development is, is pretty impressive and pretty cool. Uh, 29 days now and 33 days at the bottom, you see it's starting to look more and more tang-like. A little bit of pigment there by the tail, the spines get longer. 46 days, a little bit more pigmentation coming in, and by 54 days, or actually 50, 51 was the earliest where we've had them transition or go through metamorphosis, where they look like a little baby blue tang. And there you go, there's one at, at 50 days and a couple more. That one's actually just starting to turn blue. Some of the other ones are still clear. They're just starting to get ready to go through metamorphosis and turn into little baby blue tangs that everyone would be familiar with. So there's some at 78 days with the characteristic yellow tail. Um, we were the first uh, to do it at the Tropical Aquaculture Lab. And uh, then Courtney Ellis over at Indian River Research and Education Center, also part of UF, uh, was also able to raise these. And this was a direct result of work that had been done by Chad Callen and his lab out at, at Oceanic Institute with yellow tangs. So we have a lot of people working on figuring out how do we grow all these species and then sharing that information to hopefully bring some of these species to market faster. And that's actually part of, a, of an initiative called the Rising Tide Conservation Initiative, uh, which is actually looking at how do we accelerate the commercialization of marine species. How do we bring more marine species from the wild into an aquaculture setting and get them to market? So we've really had some great successes over the last three to five years. Um, you may look at that survival rate and say, wow, Matt, 27 out of 50,000 eggs, that's not really a tremendous survival rate, um, but it's a place to start. I, I couldn't even tell you what survival would be like in the wild, um, pretty low. Um, for us, we're not super happy with 0.05%, but it's better than the 0% that we were getting for the previous two to three years. And it's, we build on it and we build on it and we, we figure out where to plug in all of those different things, all those considerations, and, and try and improve on it until we have a protocol where someone can make money with it. We've been able to figure this guy out uh, pretty well too. There's actually, we have a master's student down at the lab, Elizabeth Groover, who's working on Halicoris wrasses and specifically the Melanuris wrasse. And we've been able to bring uh, this species through about almost 10 times now. Uh, and you can see there the progression from one day post hatch where their eyes aren't pigmented and it still has yolk to 11 days where there's actually that white spot in the middle is the, the swim bladder and it's, its gut starts to get more complex to down by uh, 21 days where you see that caudal fin starts to develop during flexion. And by 37, it actually starts to pigment up and you see those spots that the adults have. And by 45, it looks pretty much like a, a, a juvenile. So again, there's your time frame too. That gives you how long you're gonna be raising that fish from egg to juvenile. And we are able to, to delineate all that and come up with a nice cookbook protocol that says this is when they feed, this is the size that they are. And this is what we want to develop and give to the producers so that they are able to, to develop new species like this. <clears throat> so to summarize for Melanuris wrasses, 
uh, we've been able to su successfully do it uh, nine times. Our highest survival is 10 times that of blue tangs, 0.54%. Uh, still not earth shattering, but pretty good for marine fish. Um, we've actually been able to complete the life cycle. So when I say complete the life cycle, what I, what I mean is, is domesticating the animal. So we take the animal, we bring it in, we get it to spawn eggs, and then we raise those up to maturity again. And then we get those offspring to reproduce spawn eggs and raise those again. So we've been able to do that and complete the life cycle for Melanurus wrasses and try and domesticate the species like we have for pigs and chickens and, and cows. Um, because as it adapts to captivity, as it adapts to an aquaculture setting, you usually will get better growth and you'll get uh, hopefully you know, better feed conversion, things like that. And we can actually start to, to select for different things and try and develop a domestic line that will grow better. Um, and we really feel actually that the, the Melanurus has some really great potential for commercial production and we're sort of, I think, on the, on the cusp of seeing some wrasses uh, come to the commercial market, hopefully. Uh, so, in conclusion, success for us and success in bringing new species to market and, and new species development for the, the Florida aquaculture industry is commercialization. We need to get these fish into the markets. We need to take the, the technology and the protocols that we're developing at academic institutions like the University of Florida and transfer those to stakeholders. Um, because new species are a, are a critical, compo uh, critical component of, of the growth and the resiliency of an aquaculture industry. And we feel it's a, a very important component of the Florida aquaculture industry. And, and we're excited to, to support uh, that side of the industry. Uh, all the work that you see here was a, was a huge conglomeration of, uh, of, of effort and contributions on the behalf of, of many people like uh, United Pet Group and Instant Ocean Spectrum Brands and Rising Tide and the SeaWorld Bush Gardens Conservation Fund, Seagrass Farms, Quality Marine, Fritz, LRS, Pisine, Dr. Tim's, some of the people you actually may see here uh, in the aquatics lounge and around. Um, so feel free to talk to them too about their contributions to rising tide and raising marine ornamental fish and, and developing new species. But we're thankful to everybody and we're, we're really excited to, to take part in this research and to continue working to bring uh, some of these new species to market. And I take any questions if anybody has anything they're interested in hearing more about. I'm sorry about. We haven't done work uh, with the pygmy angels, but that's one. Um, that's one. There, there's a decent amount of, of work being done with with pygmy angels. There's certain people who've specialized in pygmy angels over time. Uh, it's definitely one of interest. Absolutely. Um, and again, it's it's figuring out. You know, how do you get them to reproduce consistently, and how do you get the larvae through consistently. We've had, there are certain species that we've had, you know, better luck with, and there's more and more that are being raised in captivity, which is great. Um, and it, it's really encouraging. It's definitely another family that we're, we're interested in exploring. Question, you used the word metamorphosis mm -hmm. in fish. I've never heard that used in fish. What is that, what does that mean? Is it just change or does it do something like we think of that bird in terms of insects where it's a complete so yeah so the word metamorph so the other term that you may hear uh, is settlement too potentially with fish so there's there's two terms that are used a lot one is settlement so you have these usually these pelagic fish which are up in the plankton floating around and then they go through what's called settlement, which is where they come down out of the plankton and they start to associate with structure on the coral reef or something like that. They may not go through metamorphosis, which is, which is broadly defined as sort of when they transition from that larval period to when they look more like, like a juvenile or just like a little adult. Um, that whole period though, I mean, there's multiple changes that you saw that go on during the, the larval period where they develop their fins and they develop swim bladders and their body shape changes drastically. Um, but metamorphosis is, is usually referring to sort of that, that end stage change, um, usually pigmentation, where the fish will go from that sort of clear, translucent maybe, to, uh, to a juvenile or a, a shape, a form that looks just like a little adult. Sure. Anybody else?
All right. Thank you, everybody, for your attention.